1984, the glacier was down there, 11 miles away. And today, it's back here, receded 11 miles. The glacier is retreating, but it's also thinning at the same time. It's like air being let out of a balloon. You can see what's called the trim line. It's the high water mark of the glacier in 1984. That vertical change is the height of the Empire State Building. One of my favorite documentaries of 2012, and arguably the most important one, is Chasing Ice, which follows award-winning photographer James Bailog as he begins the Extreme Ice Survey, where he and a small team placed time-lapse cameras by glaciers around the world to gather concrete visual evidence of global warming by documenting the disappearance of the world's glaciers. And the images Bailog and director Jeff Orlowski brought back are both breathtaking and terrifying, from glaciers receding and deflating at an astonishing rate to footage of enormous chunks of glacial ice the size of multiple football fields breaking off into the ocean. I spoke with Baylog and Orlowski about chasing ice, the politicization of climate change, and a lot more. So check out my interview with them and go to chasingice.com to find out how you can see the movie, spread the word about it, and do your part to stop climate change. Uh, so James, to start off, I mean, you talked about it some in, in the movie, but uh, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about what is it that attracted you to, to uh, photographing ice. I've uh, been a mountaineer for 40 years. I've traveled a lot of the world looking at these incredible uh, landscapes all over the place in the Himalaya and the Alps and the Andes and Alaska. And I just think they're uh, fascinating places to look at. And then uh, back about 15 years or so ago, I realized that, uh, that ice was the place where you could see climate change in action. And uh, that sooner or later I would have to uh, if I was serious about being an environmental photographer and looking at the issues of our time, I would have to do climate change, and I kept thinking, okay, that story will be in the ice some way or another. Uh, that is really what led to the Extreme Ice Survey and this film, Chasing Ice. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess real quick, uh, what is the Extreme Ice Survey up to these days? We started out in 2007 putting time-lapse cameras out at all these different glaciers all around the world. And as we sit here today, uh, we have 34 cameras at 16 glaciers in uh, Greenland, Iceland, Montana, Canada, uh, Alaska, and Nepal by Mount Everest. And they, the cameras are, are sitting there bolted to bed, bedrock right next to these glaciers, clicking away every half hour, looking at how the landscape is changing. Uh, we also have amassed a gigantic, oh, by the way, that, that is a portfolio of a million images that have been compiled in the past uh, six years in the course of that work. We also have a huge collection of, of traditional single frame photos uh, celebrating the art and architecture of ice. And uh, so we're, we're carrying on, keeping this record going more or less indefinitely in the future. And I guess uh, a question for both of you. I mean, one of the ideas that, uh, that I thought was really interesting was when you, talk, you talked about that, that glaciers are both powerful and fragile. And I think that, you know, a lot of sort of the, the opposition to climate change is the idea that oh, something as grand as the weather, we would not be able to, you know, we would not be able to affect. So I just wonder if you kind of talk about those ideas a bit. Well, that's been the, the, the new understanding of, uh, of really human science and human perception has just kind of coalesced over the past 10 or 15 years around the realization that humans, in fact, by virtue of our technology, by virtue of the size of our population, uh, by virtue of our desire for a certain kind of consumer affluence, uh, we have become the dominant agents of change on the planet today. We, we uh, the, the pace of change that we are imposing on the natural systems is uh, greater than what nature would do if left to its own devices. So we are changing the basic physics, chemistry, and biology of the earth which is kind of a mind-boggling idea. It's a revolutionary idea. Every bit as revolutionary as, say, the theory of relativity or evolution. You know, I know that in the, in the past, a lot, of, uh, a lot of environmental movies have gotten, have gotten attacked by, by uh, the right wing. I mean, uh, Gasland springs to mind. Uh, I was wondering whether, whether you guys have, have gotten on their radar and have gotten any, uh, any response yet uh, trying to uh, debunk or discount your work. Yeah, it's been very interesting because there's been surprising, surprisingly little commentary uh, criticizing the film. There were a couple of posts that came out before Sundance that were very negative that, you know, this issue is a, is a hoax and climate change isn't happening. But since the film opened at Sundance, there's been very, very little, um, you know, rebuttal against the, the film. 
we've been the arrows are still in the air aiming for our backs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been prepared for it we've yeah. been you know anticipating that that it's likely going to happen at some point and you know honestly we would welcome the conversation because this is this is what we saw this is what we experienced this is the evidence that we've collected and if people have a different story to tell uh, you know we we'd love to see where that dialogue goes mm -hmm. We would welcome somebody else to go and work for six years in the kinds of conditions we have and see if they have an alternative narrative. Yeah. For, for each of you, I guess, if you could guarantee that one person in the world would absolutely see the movie, uh, who would you choose? I think if there was just one person who I felt needed to see the film or should see the film, I would say it is President Obama in terms of him being the single most influential and powerful person to make a difference about this issue moving forward. And we've been trying to facilitate that, and we've had some friends who have uh, offered DVD copies to him, but he's been busy the past couple of months, so we understand he's probably not seen it yet. But um, I think that President Obama is probably the most critical person. We'd love to see the film. I would love to organize a little party and have President Obama in Hu Jintao, who I think is the president or pre premier of China, mm -hmm. in the same room together. Let's sit down with some popcorn and some beer, and let's watch the film together. Let's see where we go after that. Mm -hmm. And invite the leading pundits and skeptics? Yeah, let's get yeah. Rush Limbaugh in there and Sean Hant. No, those guys just make a lot of noise. No, forget that. But I was actually wondering whether there was um, what plans you have to to take it to Washington, D.C., or, ha yeah. or have screenings at think tanks and things like that? Yeah, so we've taken the film to Congress, and we did a screening at Congress. We also gave out copies of the DVD to every senator and congressman to all the offices in Washington. So we feel like we've upheld that uh, responsibility with that, um, but we still want to... It wasn't a goal when we were first making the film. It wasn't a goal to make a movie in the beginning of the project. And yeah. then after we decided we were going to make a movie, we didn't want it to be about climate change, and we didn't want it to be a political film. We kept it very, very apolitical during the the editing process. And what we've ended up with is a film that we've been told, we the response has been that people are shifting their opinions around the issue. And it's it's given us a different objective with what we could do with the film. And so the mindset now, it's, it's opened us up to the opportunity of the film actually having some influence over the politics. And, and we want to see how far it could potentially go. But we feel very strongly that this is not a political film, and we don't want it politicized by left or right, Republican or Democrat. You know, this issue is a universal issue. It's of interest to every child, woman, and man, all seven billion of us on the planet. And uh, we don't want it to be turned into a political football. And I think it's really profoundly unfortunate that, that climate change has, has been turned into a political debate, an ideological test for a lot of people in recent years. And I, th I think that's wrong. So for Jeff, I was wondering, you know, you as a, as, a, as a filmmaker and cinematographer, I mean, what were some things that you learned from, uh, from spending so much time with James? Uh, I, I've learned so much in the process and being out in the field. I, I think the biggest thing that I learned was approaching, um, using James's uh, philosophy behind still photography and trying to apply that to the film um, in terms of the way he thinks about making a still image and the, the importance of the story in a still photograph. There were right many times where anybody who was shooting video or time lapse, we would say that we would have the open conversation. What would James do if he was in this scenario? And trying to figure out, you know, how would we, how would he approach shooting a particular scene or shooting a particular photograph or time lapse? And if we could, you know, convey that, um, then it, it, I think that made this the film stronger as a whole. What were some of the most kind of important myths about yeah. climate change that you that you wanted yeah. to make sure we're uh, we we did not want this to be a very science heavy film i don't consider it a science movie i don't consider it a political movie i consider it really the experience that james and james and our team had doing this project doing the extreme ice survey and we kept the science to an absolute minimum and only involved the science when it was important to understand what was going on important to understand the significance of either particular uh type of glacial function or feature, or um, the historical context, or why a glacier's movement was, was important. Um, so we, we tried to keep it to an absolute minimum, and, and I, I hope that the science just illustrates um, the significance of the, the work the without really, the, the context, without yeah. being too heavy-handed. And, and to me, the big takeaway point is that nature isn't natural anymore. And, and the argument that the skeptics will always give you at that Thanksgiving dinner or the Fourth of July backyard barbecue is that 
this is all natural variation. And I, I believe that the facts as they're known by the scientific community, measurable facts that have been quantified and tested over and over again by scientists from all around the world, is that nature is, is, has moved, the composition of the atmosphere has moved out beyond what nature naturally does. We have 40% more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than nature has had in millions of years. And the only reason that extra gas is in the atmosphere is because of, of human impact. And that has profound consequences for the way the atmosphere behaves. That much has been known for over 100 years. So, you know, this is, this is real and immediate and concrete. Nature isn't natural anymore. Is there a website where you can see more of the time-lapse photos? I mean, it, it, was, it was great to, to see them in, at the end, but I, was, I watched it with a friend and he was like, I want to see more of that, like, because obviously yeah. you were collecting a lot. All the additional time lapses and a lot of extra photos, we're going to be releasing those over the next couple of weeks. We're releasing an iPad, iPad app fairly soon that is going to be kind of the culmination of all the materials, and all of it will be on the Extreme Eye Survey website as well. And, and the idea here is that we want to share this imagery and share all the evidence with the public. Um, it doesn't do any value for it to sit on hard drives in our offices. We want the images to get out there as, as much as possible. I was curious about the idea of, of sort of the the glacier tipping point in terms of like when we've lost enough that we won't be able to go back and there'll be too much kind of dark, you know, ocean absorbing water. I was wondering if you could talk more about that and whether we've reached it or gone over it. They're really complicated processes. Yeah, the, there, there's, the there's, there's, a, there's a lot of moving parts to these processes. And, and the dark water issue that you're referring to is called Arctic amplification. And that relates to the ice pack that's floating on the surface of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and that has nothing to do with glaciers that are melting on land so, or, or, or breaking apart as they enter the water, uh, as they enter the ocean. So uh, as it happens, just the other day, I ran into the guy who's the head of the National Snow and Ice Data Center. This guy is the, absolutely the last word on the question of Arctic amplification, and he said, I'm still going with the basic guess that end of summer sea ice in the Arctic will have disappeared by more or less 20 years from now. He said, I yeah. think that's where we are. So, uh, you know, the Arctic Ocean will refreeze in the wintertime, but it will, it will be gone in the summers. And that's an extraordinary development. Because Has that ever happened? In human, in, in human history, that's never happened before. Uh, so that's, that's a big thing uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, land-based glacier ice, it's going to take a long time for that to go away, if it ever goes away. You know, we, we don't know. These are, these are big masses of ice in Greenland, uh, but we do know that, uh, that mountain glaciers are retreating at a, quite a significant rate, and, um, and, and Greenland is deflating. Antarctica has some huge ice streams that are deflating right now that are dumping ice out of the interior and out into the ocean. If you look at the glaciers in, uh, you kind of take a swath across the northern hemisphere, and you look at Alaska, uh, the Rocky Mountains in the, both the U.S. and Canada, you look at the Alps, you look at uh, the Himalaya, um, over the past 30 or 40 years, it's as if somebody took a big knife and scraped off about 40 vertical feet of ice, on average, from all those glaciers. That's the aggregate average of ice loss on all, on all those glaciers, and that's a lot of snow, and that's a lot of ice. Those glaciers are typically only somewhere between 100 and 200 feet thick. They're not nearly as thick as most people think they are. There isn't that much ice there. So you go scraping off 40 feet, you've made a big change in the, uh, the balance of that glacier. Have you guys been approached or are you approaching uh, Fox News to try to get on there? We had a Fox reporter in here just a couple hours ago. We welcome the chance to engage and have a conversation with, uh, with all sides of the political spectrum because it's not a political issue, once again. I mean, Fox News has, has can, they've put out a bit of misinformation around the issue um, through some of their reporters and some of their commentators. Um, we're really just trying to bring clarity to the issue and bring our evidence and our imagery that we've collected. I really, I love that the idea that kind of comes out towards the end of the film about that, about, you know, uh, James, that what you did was, you know, your, your talent, you know, the, the talent that you have, the special talent that you have, and then, using that and directing that towards climate change and that um, that's something that all of us should should try to do if you can expand on, on those ideas. We all have our own individual strengths and characteristics that we can bring to the story and 
you know, some of us might be financial engineers and can affect the, the, the economic future of this, and some of us are maybe build wind turbines or whatever, but most of us don't. Most of us are, are have, have skills that don't seem to apply to solving this issue. But what we all have is a voice. Homo sapiens is a communicating species. We talk to each other a lot. That's what we're doing right now, you and I and that camera. And um, it, we think it's vitally important that all of us get this story in our heads, shift our perception about it to understanding that climate change is real, and then in turn put that story back out in their world and try and deflect the behavior and, and, and intention of society and the people around us, whether it's uh, individuals in your home and all that does is make you change your light bulbs or it's maybe at work and people do different things in their in some sort of a work setting, I don't know, putting solar panels on the roof or whatever it is. There's lots and lots of different ways people can have an effect on this, but it's all connected ultimately with using the voice. Yeah, and because he he explained what I typically say about you, I typically give <laughs> James credit for using his skills as a photographer, and and everybody on our team who is coming into this, whether they were the lawyers or the web designers or the editors, everybody's coming in with a different skill set, and they're offering their services to do something about this issue. Um, I've been thinking often because of the political, because um, the election period, the the President Kennedy quote asked not what you can what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, and when people are asking us. You know, what should I do about, what can I do? My, I've been thinking lately, don't ask me what you can do. Tell me what you can do. Like, tell, let me know what you can do. How can you help us? How can you help this mission? How can you help get the story out there? How can you shift awareness around climate change? So I, I think that's the big question. Like, what, what can we do collectively? What can people do to make a difference here? You help to get yourself educated. You help to spread the truth. And you use your voice. <laughs>